Ohlone peoples. <clears throat> we also must acknowledge that the prosperity of the United States has depended on the labor of enslaved people. Beyond these acknowledgments, I invite you to learn more about our history and where we've come from. <clears throat> Pardon me. I am, I am Erica George. I'm the director of the Tanner Humanity Center at the University of Utah, and I'm also the Samuel D. Thurman Professor of Law. The Tanner Center is named for Obert and Grace Tanner, and it serves to promote inquiry and exchange in the humanities. We do this through our existing programs, which include advancing educational enrichment, promoting academic research, and engaging in public outreach, and this is part of that for us. Um, with the global pandemic, we've now switched to Tanner Humanities at Home, so we're coming to you from our homes, and we're happy to have you with us. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the facilitator of our first virtual Humanities at Home Town Hall. Our moderator is Professor Kate Coles. Mm. Excuse me. <clears throat> Catherine Coles has published seven collections of poems, most recently Wayward by Red Hen Press in, 19, in, in 2019. Her memoir, Look Both Ways, was released in 2018 by Turtle Press, which will also publish The Stranger I Become, Essays in Reckless Poetics in 2021, and Solve for X, a new collection of poems. She's received awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Guggenheim Foundation. She's a distinguished professor in the Department of English here with us at the University of Utah. Um, and her work often intersects art and science. Um, she's been gracious and agreed to experiment with us in this, our first virtual town hall. With that, please join me in thanking um, Professor Coles. Hi, thank you so much, Erica. And I want to just begin by saying uh, what I was saying a little while ago to the panelists, which is I could not be happier with the um, panelists that we've assembled today. I think we're going to have a really wonderful time. Uh, I'm going to begin by introducing all of them um, in the order in which they'll be speaking. And uh, panelists, just be reassured that you don't have to memorize the order. I will say your name when it's time for you to go, but it's a good idea if maybe for you to have a sense of whether you're early, late, et cetera. Um, these introductions will be more than they deserve, but uh, I want to give them as much time as possible. So please do look them all up. Um, then I'm going to take about three minutes just to introduce the subject before turning things over to them. Um, first up, partly in keeping with the idea that creativity involves the unexpected and shaking things up, we're going to begin with biology professor Nalini Nadkarni, known as the queen of the forest canopy, uh, who explores life in the forest canopies of Costa Rica. She's published over 130 scientific articles and three scholarly books. Dr. Nadkarni brings science and conservation to face-based faith-based groups, urban youth, artists, and incarcerated adults and youth. She has been featured in journals ranging from science and the Journal of Ecology to Glamour and Playboy, and has a treetop Barbie created by Mattel Corporation in her image, and you should definitely look at that up. Her work is supported by the National Science Foundation and the National Geographic Society. Her awards include a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Archie Car Medal for Conservation and the William Julius Wilson Award for Achievement in Social Justice. Second up will be a professor of painting and drawing here at Utah, V. Kim Martinez, who is deeply committed to public engagement through the arts. In 2002, she created a community mural course in which students create, propose, and implement public art in the form of mural designs and site-specific painting throughout the Salt Lake City area. And you have seen these, whether you're aware of it or not. She has also created an in interdisciplinary undergraduate experience at the university's Taft-Nicholson Center in Centennial Valley, Montana. Martinez has received numerous grants and awards, including the U's Distinguished Innovation and the Impact Award, Salt Lake City Mayor's Visual Artist Award, especially recognizing her contribution to the Utah Department of Corrections Women's Facility, and a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Coming up third, Tanisha Nicole Tyler is a Black, queer, non-binary activist and poet living in Minneapolis by way of Salt Lake City. 
Tanisha Nicole holds a, B a BA in creative writing from Westminster College and has been actively using poetry as a means of connecting with others and creating change since 2014. They have performed in venues across the country and in 2018 placed fourth overall with their team at the National Poetry Slam competition in Chicago. Their work has appeared, <coughs> excuse me, or is forthcoming in Button Poetry, SLCC Bruin Voices series, Write About Now, TEDx, Voicemail Poems, Peculiar, Ink and Nebula, Prickly Pear, Printing, and more. In their spare time, Tanisha, Tanisha Nicole can be found spending time with their partner, Annie, and pet cat, Muse, Muse Spresso. Fourth up, Dominica Green is a black woman making sense of the world through the participation, creation, and consumption of art, whatever art is. Green holds a BFA in contemporary dance from the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. She maintains close collaborative relationships with Helen Simono, Jasmine Hearn, Kayla Farish, Burr Johnson, and Kate Wallet. She has toured domestically and internationally, including festivals in Burkina Faso and China. She is a company member with the internationally renowned and local Ryrie Woodbury Dance Company here. Uh, she proudly teaches a dance church and she has instructed classes in Seattle, New York, and Los Angeles, and now manages the Salt Lake City team and all dance church social media. Her research questions everything. And finally, described by Outside Magazine as America's only all natural politician composer, Philip Bimstein is an Emmy award-winning composer for Red Rock Rondo and former mayor of Springdale, where Parade Magazine dubbed him the man who brought civility back to town. His many compositions, among them Half Moon at Checkerboard Mesa, Cats in the Kitchen, and Garland Hershey's Cows, have been performed at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, the Kennedy Center, the Spoleto and Aspen Music Festivals, London's Royal Opera House, on NPR, and with his new wave band, Fill in the Blanks, on N MTV. He's an assistant professor in our Honors College, teaching Radical Quiet, kindness and composing a community. His public speaking includes the TEDx talk, how to practice politics with music in mind. When after I had told Erica, I would ever asked me to do, she and Beth James approached me about organizing this discussion. I wasn't sure I was the right person not only because a quick glance at the health and mortality history of great artists and maybe especially writers isn't necessarily encouraging. Though Keats probably got TB because he was a phys physician who nursed his dying brother, not because he was a poet. What I said at the time, I think somewhat to the surprise of my colleagues was that in my experience, creative people and certainly artists don't do what they do in order to be or to become well. Poets, for example, make poems precisely in order to make poems. But I do think most creative people would agree that a sense of wellness may arise as a side effect or unexpected consequence of creativity. Creative people may feel driven to work in part just because working, even or maybe especially in its difficulties, is frankly so pleasurable. In addition, creative practice provides a focus outside the self, directing us away, in my case at least, from our discontents or feelings of unwellness. There's also science on this which of course I felt compelled to look up as exemplified by a seminal study led by psychologist Nicholas Turiano in 2012. He drilled down on the personal quality of openness, which is kind of broadly defined in psychology, uh, measuring cognitive flexibility and the willingness to entertain novel ideas, which is a known protective factor in health and longevity. He found that as a subcategory of openness, creative thinking specifically keeps the brain healthy by maintaining the integrity of neural networks even into old age, and so decreases mortality risk. Hooray. 
Turiano notes also that creative people just handle stress better. He says they may see stressors more as challenges that they can work to overcome rather than as stressful obstacles that they can't overcome. Again, the pleasures of difficulty. According to Scientific American, although most studies have looked at those who are naturally open-minded, and just as an aside, I'll have to say, I'm not entirely sure what naturally open-minded means, um, results suggest that practicing creative thinking techniques might improve anyone's health by lowering stress and exercising the brain. So with that very encouraging news, I think we can now hear about specific ways in which our panelists practice and use their creativity, uh, beginning with Nalini. <clears throat> Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Erica. Um, I think the, the idea of, of examining and exploring this link between wellness and creativity is a great topic now specifically, but really always. And what I'd like to do with my time is to share my thoughts on a specific kind of creative process that I think instills wellness um, in situations that relate to a diverse um, set of scales and venues, what I call tapestry thinking. And tapestry thinking was really inspired by my studies of tropical rainforests where, where really everything is interwoven, species and interaction. So it's, it's really a kind of thinking that's developed from my own studies. And I define tapestry thinking as the creative interweaving of threads from different societal sectors, an ordered gathering of, of, of different strands of beliefs, of values, and of ceremonies that together can create a novel image. And I think of this as being different from sort of blurring different values together, like mixing red paint and white paint to make pink paint, um, but rather um, the individual strands in tapestry thinking retain their primary and intense color. And the outcome of tapestry thinking um, can mimic a real tapestry, something that's connected, that's complex, that's useful, that's strong, and that's beautiful. And what I'd like to do is to tell you two stories about tapestry thinking that demonstrate these links between creativity and wellness. The first story is at a large scale, um, describing some efforts I've done to, to create a tapestry of artists and scientists that can help create awareness of the need to protect the well-being of the earth. And the second story is on sort of a smaller spatial scale, weaving together diverse ways of knowing in order to enhance the wellness of a single human being. So first, that large scale idea of weaving together diverse ways of knowing to enhance um, uh, conservation thinking. Um, since childhood, I've been driven to study and to protect trees. I specialize on the forest canopy, which is filled with just an incredible diversity of plants and animals. And I know that when I'm in the canopy, I feel myself as part of this complex three-dimensional tapestry of species and interactions that I can observe and learn from. But this very tapestry, this complex, useful, beautiful tapestry of the rainforest is being rent apart by human activities, by climate change, by deforestation, by isolation of individual trees in pastures. And I think that this sense of isolation is a disturbance that is going on at the same time with humans and nature. Um, and being a scientist and being a person who's concerned with humans as well as trees, um, I wanted to help. Um, and so about 15 years ago, I started my own nonprofit, the International Canopy Network. Um, I work with traditional media and with museums to create materials that might instill a sense of conservation. But I found that all of these efforts were really going towards um, people who were already convinced of and well aware of the importance of trees and forests. And so I felt that I really needed to appeal to those who um, might not have ecological values in mind, but might have other values like aesthetic values, for example, that could be woven, those aesthetic threads could be woven into a tapestry of conservation for trees and forests. And so my approach to this was really to sort of set up what I think of as a loom where the warp of the, of the loom are filled with the threads of the ecological values of trees, but into which I could weave together the aesthetic values that artists might have and be able to articulate visual art about trees and forests, rap music, poetry, and dance. And so I'll just share with you a few of these connections that, that we've been able to make through a, a technique that I call canopy confluences. Um, what we've done is to bring together a group of forest ecologists, 
artists, rap singers, opera singers, uh, poets, creative writers, um, loggers, uh, people who have never seen trees like um, uh, Inuits, um, and to weave together a tapestry that creates novel messages of conservation. Um, some of the outcomes really have been oriented towards arts or audiences rather than scientific audiences. This is a piece of work that was created after one of our confluences by Bruce, Bruce Chow, who's at the Rhode Island School of Design, that really exemplifies the ephemeral nature of, of forest ecology and forest dynamics. We also created a gallery of some of the products that were created by the artists on our canopy confluence. We brought musicians in. One of them was a rap singer, a young rap singer named um, Duke Brady. Uh, we then used his music to inspire hiring a rap artist to bring together at-risk urban youth uh, to create their, to experience the forest and create their own rap songs, create their own CD, and to make their own performances of spo spoken word poetry, hip hop music, and um, slam poetry about trees and nature. Um, I also received a wonderful opportunity by contact with a, a dance choreographer named Jody Lomask. She runs what's called the Capacitor Lab, where she brings scientists and artists together to create dances for dance theater uh, participants and uh, dance audiences about different aspects of science. So I brought her and her troop down to my long-term study sites in Costa Rica. I taught them all how to climb trees. Within three days, they had taken off their clothes and were dancing naked in the forest. When they came back to, to uh, San Francisco where Capacitor lives, they created a wonderful dance called Biome. And the way we worked this performance was for me to give a 10 minute talk about the science of, of cloud forests, their fragility, their diversity. Um, then she and her, her dance troupe performed this beautiful, very inspiring dance about the emotions and the passions that come out when you look at tropical rainforests. And finally, we had a number of tables in the lobby where audience members could go after the performance to actually volunteer for conservation activities. So in this way, we were able to bring messages about how diverse, how complex, how important uh, canopies and forest ecology is and forest ecosystems are to a very different kind of audience than what I would be able to do as a scientist. What was really interesting in this process for me as a scientist and, and not as an artist, but someone who worked and collaborated closely with an artist um, was the fact that Jody the choreographer became my intellectual partner. It wasn't that she was acting out what I told her about tropical rainforest. She came up with her own exciting scientific questions um, that she could pose after she had been exposed to the tropical rainforest and to scientists. And so this really taught me that when I collaborate with, with artists in the future, that I don't just use them as communicators, but rather we partner as intellectual equals in trying to understand a complex connected system. We also became very good friends, and I think this um, elaborates on the personal relationships that can develop between creative people and scientists. Um, that's really important, I think, in terms of developing this, this move towards wellness when we work together. So we were able, I think, in this case, one case of, of, of linking together, weaving together a dance with um, ecological values to create novel messages that would not have otherwise been able, I would have able, been able to do as a scientist myself. Um, the second story I'd like to tell you about in terms of tapestry thinking um, relates to human health and, um, uh, and, and art, artistic and, int and intellectual mingling of different disciplines. And this actually came as a result of the research that I've been doing, looking at relic trees and trying to understand human activities on, on tree ecosystems. I was climbing into some trees about five years ago. I actually fell from a tree 50 feet from the top of a big leaf maple tree. Um, my rope failed, I was medevaced out. I had severe, very traumatic injuries. Um, I sort of hate to show this, but this is what happened. Um, I was incapacitated really pretty much for six months. Um, it was not only the fear of not only, you know, it was the fear that, that gripped me, not only in terms of the physical incapabilities that I was experiencing at the time, but also this question of identity. I knew who I'd been. I've been an active researcher. I've been a teacher. I've been a, a science communicator. I've been a wife and a mother and a friend and an active outdoors person. But the question I had for myself lying there by myself in the hospital is who will I be? 
And it was at that point that I realized, well, I might be fortunate and be able to recover fully physically, which I actually have. It's kind of a medical miracle that I've been able to come back um, with my full capacity. Um, but I think when, when my medical colleagues asked me about how I, as a 64-year-old woman, was able to recover from these injuries, I had to attribute it at least partially to tapestry thinking. And I'll share this with you. Um, back in 2014, this was a year before my fall, um, I was studying these relic trees and I didn't, wasn't able really to get at theory in ecology. And I was turned down for funding to study relic trees because I didn't have a theory. But I thought that perhaps other fields that deal with disturbance and recovery might have theories I could borrow. And so I pulled together a number of researchers at the University of Utah through the find a researcher feature of our website. Uh, these are faculty members who study disturbance and recovery in relic structures in their own fields of refugee studies, urban planning, modern dance, human development, traffic engineering, neuroscience, and forest ecology. We met once a month, two hours a month. We first talked about how each of us in our own fields uh, studies disturbance and recovery. And then the second semester, we pulled out emerging themes uh, from all of our fields. And I'd like to share three of those with you. One of them is the web of relationships that is so important in terms of recovery of isolated uh, elements within disturbed systems, whether this is an isolated tree in a pasture or whether it's a little baby, like our human attachment theory psychologist, uh, Russ Isabella talked about how what happens when you break, when you have a disturbance between a parent and a baby, very often that child suffers from the inability to trust people as adults. But what Russ was able to tell us was that when there's a web of relationships, when an uncle, for example, can take the place of a father figure, those negative aspects can be mitigated. And so it was with me when I was recovering my web of relationships, my family and friends, my, my roommates in the hospital ward were very, very important. They were instrumental in my getting better. A second kind of emerging theme was about the variability of consequences that, that follow disturbance. Um, we had been talking a lot about the negative aspects of disturbance, just the language we use, the catastrophic fire, forest fires, or the devastating effects of hurricanes uh, was very much a prevalent way of thinking about disturbance. But for example, our faculty member who studied refugees said, well, there are negative consequences when disturbed populations move, say, from South Sudan to Salt Lake City as refugees, refugees but there are also positive aspects of this. Many of the young women, for example, get access to education, which they would not do in their home country. And it was at this moment that the artist in our group, Ellen Bromberg, who's a, a modern dancer said, I don't know what you guys are talking about all these difficult negative aspects of disturbance. In the arts, we actually welcome disturbance. Without disturbance, I as a modern dancer would still be dancing ballet. And so she really saw and termed disturbance as a portal to the new. And this is something the rest of us in the scientific and engineering disciplines hadn't really thought about, but which was very important in terms of another conclusion we came to that this is the idea of the third state, that we tend to think that after a disturbance, a system returns to its original state. And there's something wrong if we're not back at our original state. But what we began to understand in all of our disciplines is that very often after a discovery, you don't ever return to your, your, your original state, but rather you come to another recovery, a third state, or another recovery, a fourth state, or a fifth state. And so this was really important to me, recovering from this tree fall, where I felt like I had been riding this bright red arrow of my career, writing proposals, writing per pa papers, getting more graduate students, getting more projects gone. But what I found during my recovery is that that bright red arrow began to fade. I began to think about other aspects of my personality, other aspects of how I might contribute. And so what I've been doing in the interim has been to spend more time building human community in my life. I now have this, what we call Monday home evening, where we gather together virtually or together a group of friends that are not only biology people, but creative other people outside of my biology friend community. I've learned how to turn wooden bowls and I go to the Utah Arts Alliance to spend time making crafts out of wood and have a new connection to trees. I spend more time playing music just for myself. And so I feel that Yes, I encountered a disturbance, but thanks to this bringing together of different disciplines, um, I was able to overcome some of those ideas or some of those challenges that I had faced then as somebody experiencing disturbance. 
So I think there will always be disturbances in our lives, our country, our planet. I think tapestry thinking has helped me think through these. From the canopy confluence, I learned that we can gain useful, creative, intellectually stimulating colleagues in the arts whose power is not only their ability to communicate, but also their capacity to take in information, to process and understand that information, and to frame it within different intellectual looms than what I as a scientist can do. And that those efforts led directly to messages and audiences about the need to conserve rainforests far beyond what I could have generated myself. I think also from the weaving of academic disciplines, um, allowed me to apply my intellect and the intellectual tools from other disciplines to explore the processes and emotions of my own recovery and to share those insights with others. And finally, I believe that whether we're concerned with the health of the earth or the broken femur of a single person, we can connect our threads of understanding with those of others to create tapestries that are like real tapestries, connected, complex, strong, useful, and beautiful. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Erica. Thanks uh, so much, Nalini. And I'm gonna move as quickly as I can in the interest of time and then ask panelists also please to keep your eye uh, on the clock so that we can um, get everybody their full time in. Um, and next up uh, is Kim Martinez. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. It took me a minute to unmute there. So, um, So, did you notice the mural in the background? This dancer is a friend of a muralist on our team. His decision to make the video in front of the mural indicated we had reached our goal of creating a piece of art that inspired the community. Since 2003, over 257 University of Utah art majors and many community members have painted 29,295 square feet of murals. That's over five and a half miles of art in our city. This class was initiated with the broad goal of bettering student artist social horizons to allow them to connect with people and communities both on and off the university campus. I developed an educational approach that sought to teach critical and social consciousness, promote dialogue across economic, political, and educational lines, and inspire action within community members and university students. I was the first recipient of the Tanner Humanities Professors Off-Campus Award in 2012. The award provided a six-month art-based project with approximately 30 community youth ranging from ages of 5 to 15 years old, 20 University of Utah students who mentored the youth. The majority of the youth were refugees and English as a second language was the norm. This image reflects our process beginning with the drawings from the community, development of a narrative strategy, and then the final mural reflecting the changes to the imagery to accommodate additional ideas. I find that community mural making can help strengthen and deepen our relationship to society and our community while simultaneously engaging in social action. Together with hospital faculty and administration, we collaborated to, make, to develop murals to aid patients and family in, in the healing processes. Our goals were to create imagery that might reduce stress and anxiety. This mural painted on three walls um, in a waiting room acted as a blanket to provide comfort while waiting for a diagnosis or a medical procedure. This mural plays on the concept of accomplishment through collective efforts. Entrance into the nursery is through the mural itself. The imagery of a cluster of toys rolling down a hill, gaining size while, an while animals gently, gently nurture and move it along become a metaphor for the phrase, it takes a collective momentum to remind parents, siblings, nurses, and doctors 
that baby's well-being is, is a combined effort of all who provide care. My experience indicates that mural making can help develop social and communication skills, conflict resolution, provide participants with a sense of accomplishment, and enhance self-esteem. Sometimes we do not see the results until years later. This mural is located near an elementary school on the walking route of several children who I invited to paint with us for a few sessions. Ten years later, I was at Central Civico in a, at a Dreamers event researching a new mural where a young, when a young man approached me and we began talking. And he told me he wanted to be a muralist. I told him I was a muralist. And he asked which ones I painted. And as I began listing the sites, I noticed his eyes watering up. I asked him if he was one of the children who would stop and paint with us, and he said yes. He explained that the experience gave him a sense of belonging in the community when he felt like an outsider due to language and cultural anxiety. This mural talks about the resistance of people of color overcoming segregation in an early 20th century amusement park. Art teaching students spent 480 hours in class and after school instruction with K through 6 students to develop the mural imagery in this 98% Latino Spanish language immersion school. This community art project serves as a tool for empowering marginalized individuals and communities of people by giving a voice and providing space and access to an empowering art form of self-expression and representation. This mural is two stories and 1,600 square feet. Right here is where the second story begins. The National Endowment of the Arts funded this project through the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, specifically to allow me to teach university and community artists the traditional painting process and theories of Mexican muralist David Alfred Siqueiros, a technique I learned from muralist Judy Baca, who learned directly from Siqueiros. We partnered with youth 6 to 15 years old at Youth City in their after school programming. University art majors worked exclusively with Youth City students to create three dimensional masks based on their power animals. Then the design team translated the masks into the mural. The, fi the figures are participating in multiple artistic disciplines to reflect the surrounding community and the building that houses the state's art archives. The design development included sensitivity to various skill levels. The team's knowledge of painting ranged from novice to college junior and none with large-scale mural experience. Artistic metaphors came to life and revealed insights into the experiences of the community. Murals can be thought of as a democratic form of public art where communities come together to collaboratively create an image to send a message and elicit a viewer's response. This mural was made after several focus groups with homeless youth and university students. Designing and painting the mural provided a space to bring individuals together, focusing on common goals while having the opportunity to feel connected to others and develop social and communication skills. Abstract thinking skills were developed by learning to be flexible and creative in how each step of the project related to the final product. From planning, design, drawing, paint mixing, and finally to the mural's completion. This project created an opportunity to foster community, enhance a sense of belonging and social awareness, and connect to others in a safe place. Through multiple workshops, we provided opportunities for discussion, creating a sense of community to enhance the physical environment and increase self-esteem at a senior center. It was critical for the group to work together during the entire process. Active communication, social and mediation skills were exercised. During this process, it was found that by the completion of the mural, individuals were able to willingly engage with one another as creating the mural provided many social opportunities. A sense of pride and accomplishment was also fostered, along with increased self-esteem. These individuals were proud of the finished project, which added to their environment's aesthetics. This community-based project included five undergraduates and seven professional K-12 educators. We designed and painted nine four by eight foot portable murals collaboratively with nine elementary, two junior high, and two high school student groups. Over 1,500 youth participated, beginning with the K through six youth who set the tone and drawings for the final works. 
I believe some solutions to challenges we confront may be addressed through the community-based education model that requires multiple points of view, numerous skill sets, and interdependence and respect so essential to our education system and society today. The experience gained from mural painting, the process of discussion, planning, and collective creativity is an exceptional learning and healing opportunity for all participants and communities. Please look at the Department of Art and Art History websites. We have, um, we have, uh, we have posted proposals for a new campus mural located at the entrance of the Browning Building. Currently, the college has invited its community to participate in the mural selection with a college-wide um, vote. Due to the coronavirus, we've altered our traditional mural making process with technology. The final mural will be printed on aluminum to reflect the artist's hands and provide social distancing. We plan on completing the installation by spring 2021. This is the site that it will be located. And these are the seven mural designs that have been collaboratively designed with the uh, um, College of Mines and Engineers and Sciences faculty, students, and staff. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. And uh, I just want to very quickly remind um, participants and audience, audience members that uh, if you have questions developing in your minds, there's a Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your screen, and you can type your questions into there. Uh, and next up is Tanisha Nicole Tyler. Thanks, Tanisha. Thank you so very much, everybody. Um, I don't have a fancy presentation, uh, but I um, I'm actually really excited to be here and listen to what these panelists have already said in regards to wellness and creativity and how the two collide. And um, it's so interesting that my fellow panelists have already done what I hope um, to have you participants and audience members at home take away. Um, and that is to, I want you to think of something you were passionate about, a cause. Uh, and while you think about that, I also want you to think about how you like to best receive your information. So for myself, uh, I'm a poet. I like to read poetry. I like to attend live events. I like to really be hands-on. Uh, but there are some people who, they like to feel it. They like to move. They like to dance. Uh, there are people who are, you know, creative in this visual sense of painting. Uh, and then there are people who are just like, let's really be one in the world with nature. And all of those are acceptable um, and highly encouraged that I want to encourage you to continue to do and find because I believe that in order to really achieve your own holistic sense of wellness and creativity uh, you have to be able to combine the two together to start a dialogue and um, I want to talk to you a little bit about how I go about starting that dialogue um, and for me as a writer I write what what I need to say uh, I write a narrative that if I don't put it on paper, it doesn't exist because I carry so many different intersections. And even if there are other people who carry similar intersections, they don't carry the exact same ones that I do. Uh, and I believe it is my personal responsibility, even if it is only for myself, to put that into the world um, in some way, shape, or form. And um, I'm going to start with a poem that I wrote. And then we're going to talk through kind of how my process of writing this poem relates to my overall ideas for um, wellness and creativity. So this poem is called The Summer of Morning, and it is dedicated to the victims of the Charleston and Orlando shootings. The Summer of Morning is the same summer in which I hear Orlando and Charleston knowing neither one of these cities were meant to be final resting places, but both hold stolen spirits. It is the summer of attending two vigils for the same horror, because the first one didn't do the community justice. It is the summer of unrest. The summer of another media erasure of dancing around the words hate crime. There's something so bitter about leaving a vigil three days after the tragedy that we'll call Pulse, in which you were full of something other than your own grief, only to awake the next morning to the anniversary of another mass shooting. 
another reminder of my own mortality. And is it not ironic that the day after the day we call tomorrow, it is one of celebration, of Black independence, though this community has been struck with more violence than peace since being liberated, or how I wish to hold those I love close but realize that we are safer across state lines than congregated in a space made sacred by our very existence. And my partner confesses that she told me she liked me after realizing that by the time she thought it to be the right time, it could be too late because I am both black and queer. She tells me she realizes how quickly each gathering mm -hmm. for healing can so quickly mm -hmm. become the wake in which we scream their names and hope someone would say ours, even if it is just to hear the sound of their own voice should any of us be lucky enough to make it out alive. And yet last night, last night I felt so alive, taking the risk of dancing in the open with other bodies and skin that looked like mine, this radical form of healing reclaiming the spaces that they want to destroy, how in these moments we forget about the hurt in our bones and can only exist that in which we make holy. So, sorry, I'm gonna like, let space exist. Um, I wake up a lot and I find myself feeling like I need to write write my way out of or into maybe a sense of survival uh, because of the world that we're currently living in. Um, to be currently, I am actually in Minnesota, right? I'm in um, Minneapolis. And to be blocks away from the George Floyd Memorial is a lot. Um, and, you know, there are days where I can't go downtown because there are protests and things have been, you know, stopping for the sake of we need, we need change, we need justice. And um, I think about how in those moments we also need community. And without community, then we cannot be entirely well. And I like to believe wellness is a abstract and both physical thing, right? I believe that we have the physicality of wellness, but that we also need to look on our westernized ideals. And that um, along with the physicality, we also have a due diligence to meet, identify, and maintain other areas of wellness that we need to have. So spiritual wellness, social wellness, creative wellness. And I know for me personally, if I'm not holistically um, if I'm not holistically viewing what it means for me to be well, then I'm not, I'm not doing the work for me to be my best self. And I'm not being as well as I can be. And I think that in times such as now where we're, you know, quarantined and maybe feel isolated, it can feel helpless. It can feel really hard to, why would you want to create in a moment that is so heart-wrenching? Like you are in the middle of trauma like we are all living through trauma right now what what would make you want to create but i think that's where um reframing the picture comes in right where we where we do things like this a virtual meeting that is still so very necessary because there are still so many people that that need to connect with somebody or something um through a shared medium or like-mindedness and to isolate ourselves, I don't think is the answer for that. It's not going to, it's not going, it's not going to help any of us be well. So I think about how when I wrote this poem, I was writing it, I was writing it for me and, and the voices that I carry. And how at the same time, even though it is for me and from my perspective, that poem can then, as soon as it's read out loud, it can become for somebody else whoever needs it, whoever, um, maybe, you know, they, you know, we talk about, we know and hear about the things that are happening in the world, but maybe you need to humanize it. Um, and the act of being creative with the cause or passion that you have is, is what causes the humanization process. And 
it's the moment of humanizing something in which real change happens. Um, so while I write poems and then I go and perform them, I don't necessarily think three minutes is going to change the world per se, but I do think, well, I know that three minutes is enough time to introduce myself to someone who I've never met before to the point where they come up to me and say, thank you. I needed to hear that. And have you heard of X? Have you heard of Y? That's how I found, find myself connecting and plugging into the community that needs me by putting my own voice out there. And um, I would really like to encourage you to do the same because without our voices, without the unique perspective that we can bring to a room of strangers, then we are preventing our, our best selves from being and also we're preventing the healing that needs to happen for our communities, right? Even if we're in positions of power or privilege, there's somebody that can benefit from you bringing what you know to the table. And I think a lot about that and how that's really what we need right now um, in the world and how that plays a lot into my creative process and how if I'm not doing it, if I can't find it to do it for me, I wanna find it to do it for um, the people that I love and the people that could benefit from me doing something. And I want to end with this quote. Uh, I watch a lot of Brene Brown. I read a lot of Brene Brown. I think that she's wonderful. And she says, loving ourselves through the process of owning our own story is the bravest thing we will ever do. So I'd like to encourage you all to be creative and be brave. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanisha, Nicole. Um, I'm just uh, delighted with the the conversation that I can see taking shape here today. Uh, and I'm really looking forward now to hearing from Dominica. Hi, um, everyone. That Just to say thank you so far for everything that has been shared. I feel uh, fortunate to be here and uh, lucky to be going after you, Tanisha. Thank you for that. Um, so I'll start by saying that my personal practice is rooted in dance and movement. Uh, to me, dance and movement are interchangeable, but lots of folks have a specific idea of what they believe dance is. So it's helpful for me to define dance simply as the act of moving. My creative output may not end up manifesting as a dance, but it is the basis of my practice. So when I speak about creating or making, I'm speaking about the process of choreographing, perhaps, dances or making art. Um, I am constantly questioning the, the purpose behind why we create. I began making my own work largely in question of and to question why we create, to question what I need to create. Uh, the need the questioning of the need versus simply wanting and doing can sometimes be unhelpful. Uh, questioning everything can prevent me from doing anything, but it does help me to narrow in on what I find to be important. I ask myself, what is essential? Uh, the, this questioning of what is essential has become important to me because as a black person in the arts, I have seen a lot of work that seems to be baseless and purely rooted in white privilege and indulgence. Uh, seemingly lacking any reflection about why it need to, needed to be made, for who it was made, and what the point of it being made was. Um, more often than not, what I deem to be essential in my art practice is no different than what is essential in my day-to-day -day life and my strive for wellness and discovering what that means. Um, defining for yourself what is essential, I believe, in, is in itself an act of wellness. Um, in terms of wellness and being well, I also have to ask myself, what is essential and what is not essential? What can I shed? What is not serving me? Is it essential because it feels good? And why does it feel good? Um, I'll be breaking down my approach to creativity and wellness and how it comes, um, how it all comes down to approaching life as a process in three ways. First, being well second, creation slash creating and wellness, and third, life as the creative process. So um, I break down wellness, sort of the umbrella term of wellness for me as being well, moving into understanding, 
moving closer to moving into being well and that as creative fuel. Um, for me, finding wellness is finding understanding of what I need, of what brings me joy, of what feels good, of what feels good because it actually feels good and not because I've been told that it should make me feel good, uh, of the world at large and of communication and how to do that with myself and with other people and with the universe. Uh, for me, largely creativity and the act of creating something almost always comes from the desire to want to better understand, to make sense of, to get closer to. This results in uh, asking lots of questions. A desire to know more about something at large is still a desire to better understand yourself. And conversely, a desire to know more about yourself will of course and inevitably impact the way that you interact with the world at large. So for me, creativity and wellness have become one in the same or and a means of achieving the other. Creativity at its core is wellness. Um, so creation as it relates to purpose, as it relates to wellness, I think about in two ways. Um, the act just the act of getting something out and being creative like the purpose behind making something regardless of the finished product just the initial push of being creative making something for yourself is in itself an act of wellness and then the purpose behind creating what was created from that initial push the purpose of or meaning behind the finished product is also moving into wellness or being well. So being able to separate the two, of course, um, obviously they intersect. Creating and finding wellness. Um, for me, the act of being creative does not always lead way for or manifest as outward wellness. In my experience, the creative process has only led to more questions and more dissonance. It has also led to immense distress because if I allow it, if you allow it, it unlocks. Specifically, the physical creative process forces you to listen and unlock your vaults, the parts of yourself that you may not be ready to hear, may not even know that you have to hear, that are there that you might may want to listen to. So um, I see wellness as the work of unlocking uh, the undoing and then wellness as the result of the undoing as well. Unlocking is an act of wellness, a digging and a dredging to uncover. The digging is the wellness and the outcome is also the wellness, create, coming into being well. Um, both are therapeutic and cathartic in different ways. I'd also like to emphasize that uh, you may not feel well when immersed in the act of moving into being well. I'll say that again, because for me, that's helpful. I may not feel well when immersed in the act of moving into being well or what will make me well. That does not mean that it's not wellness. That does not mean that it's not for my well-being. Uh, something uh, that I will ask myself is, do I feel well? Perhaps not. Am I well? Perhaps yes. Or another way. Do I feel beautiful? No, not right now. Am I beautiful? Yes. Through the process of making, I have moved closer to my wellness because I have moved closer to what I feel and need and value. Whether the end goal is I'm making this to be well or not, because it rarely is. Usually it's, I want to crack this code. I want to understand this better. Wanting to understand is an act of wellness, is moving into wellness. Only through engaging in the process of creation have I begun to understand the thing, the code I wish to crack, sometimes and most often without exactly knowing what the code is. The thing I sought to make sense of in entering into the process may reveal itself to me and most likely will reveal itself to me in a way that is completely an unexpected result that in itself feels like the true process, feels like the, the glowing orb of creativity, setting out to make something as a means of knowing something better, 
and allowing the expectation and the idea of that something to take you in the direction that it needs to go rather than the direction that you had envisioned. The process of finding, of seeking what you need to understand is wellness, is for wellness sake, is for your well-being, is to understand. I don't want to separate what I need to understand as an artist and what I need to understand as a human pedestrian navigating this world, because in my process, in my life, there is no difference. There is no difference between wellness in my art practice and wellness in my life. No separation between my life and my art. This is not to say that I'm making all of the time, but understanding that the process of life is what my create my creative process is hoping to uncover so they can't be any different when approaching creativity as a way of life with the understanding that the goal is moving into being well simply then the existing becomes a creative process and thus an act of wellness uh, lastly life as the creative process um, through exposing and uncovering parts of myself that I didn't know were there purely through making and creating, I discovered that both must live within each other intertwined. I can't uncover the darkest parts of myself in the studio re rehearsing or researching and then move on to the sidewalk or the street unfazed and unaffected. Once I uncover the crux, then the work is always flowing into my life, the work of being a creative, the work of act, asking questions. And that really is for me what being a creative is, asking questions. So this can't live only in the studio or only outside of the studio, a rolling into all parts of oneself, finding symbi symbiosis within all parts of myself. Then creativity and the creative process inevitably integrates itself into all parts of my life. A conscious understanding without any added effort, mental or physical or emotional, that watering my plants, just as scrambling my egg, just as lying in my luscious, comfortable bed, just as having a wonderful, beautiful conversation is all a part of the process, is the process to better understand. If I can see all parts of my life as the process with no pressure of the process producing anything, other than moving into being well, then I am creative. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dominica. That was just fantastic. And um, just as a quick orientation, um, Philip Bimstein will be our last speaker in just a moment. Uh, and then we will open things up for a Q&A. And of course, I have a gazillion questions, but I'm approximately a gazillion. But I'm um, most interested in questions from the audience. And so please do feel free to put those into the Q&A and I'll get to them as much as I can. And then as a special treat for us today, um, we will be after the Q&A wrapping up with a guided meditation from uh, Philip Bimstein, uh, who will walk us through that with the hope that um, for those of you who have missed lunch in order to be here, we'll, we'll send you out uh, with a kind of fullness afterwards. So, Philip. Yes, and maybe a kind of emptiness as well. A good kind of emptiness. Anyway, thank you, Kate, and thank you, Erica, for inviting me, and thank you to everyone who's here and for uh, the artists who've already spoken. Before I get to my my little talk, I just want to mention a few things that I resonate with uh, out of so many. Kate, in her introduction, talking about creativity being pleasurable and the pleasures of difficulty. I, I think these are some some of these would be themes that I might touch upon. And Nalina talking about a complex connected system that we're all a part of. And Tanisha talking about the moment of humanizing is what can change things. I really relate to that. And Dominica just now, life is a creative process to get closer to um, and the push uh, to create is well is wellness itself. So just just lovely. Um, so I'd like to talk about how, for me, creativity, wellness, mindfulness, and related qualities like stillness and quiet, um, improvisation and spontaneity all proceed 
from the same place, all occupy the same space. And they open us up to the same states, presence, awareness, awakeness, humanness, as uh, Tanisha referred to, and being alive. And how, it seems to me, creativity is not only a product or you know, work like, in my case, a piece of music or a vis piece of visual art. And it's not only a process, but at root, it's a state, a state of being, a quality of presence. So one of the questions Kate asked us to consider is, is wellness a goal when I create? Well, not in my punk band about 35 years ago. I can't say that wellness was first thing on my mind. But in the last 30 so years or so, it, it sort of has become. And so I'm going to play you briefly a few pieces of music, uh, maybe three. Let's see. Share screen. And let's see. Got to maneuver this. Uh, let's see. Where is that? Chrome. Okay. Share computer sound. Good. Good so far. All right. It looks like it's working. All right. So, um, uh, yeah, so a piece that I wrote, uh, oh, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, um, was based on stories that I gathered from the Kaibab Paiute tribe uh, in southern Utah. And they had been offered a toxic waste incinerator and had voted it down, uh, turning down a lot of money in favor of the sacredness of their land. So I wrote a piece celebrating that. And um, I uh, also, you know, included their voices. Uh, that, that was the whole start of it. And um, one was uh, Lucille Jake, and I'm also here preserving uh, a song of hers and, and her story. So here's just a little bit of it. I sang about the willows and the water. When the water's running, it has a white foam. Oh, I've heard the old people sing it. It's handed down from people to people. I think I'm the last one that remembers that song. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, I'll stop it there. And um, a piece I wrote a few years later was based on uh, Terry Tempest Williams' book, Refuge. And I, I use her voice and her words uh, in this. And to me, uh, her work in my piece was celebrating uh, spiritual wholeness. And I'm going to play you just a little bit, two little sections of the second movement called Silence, where she starts off uh, saying the words that her mother said to her uh, when her mother was on her deathbed. And then I will jump to another part where Terry speaks uh, more about silence. So here we go. I just want to listen to the silence with you by my side. <laughs> I just want to listen to the silence with you by my side. And then jumping to another part, let's see, right there, okay. We are seldom conscious when silence begins. It is only afterward that we realize what we have been a part of. Silence. That ringing silence. Okay, and I, I believe, I'm sure we all do, that silence is so important so, for so many reasons, uh, for wellness and for creativity and for intimacy. Uh, but now I want to play you just a little bit of perhaps my most, my piece which is perhaps most explicitly about, um, about wellness. Uh, it's, uh, it's called the Brahma Viharas, and it's, about, it's uh, a symphonic work on the four uh, Buddhist uh, meditations on kindness, compassion, empathy, and equanimity. And this is my wife, Charlotte Bell, playing the English horn. I'll just play you 15 seconds of this.
So now let's see. Let's stop share. Okay, looks like I'm back. All right, so just to give you a little sample of my work and how it might uh, sometimes connect to, to wellness. Oops, I almost left the meeting. <laughs> Wait a moment. Uh, okay, there we go. So, um, so now I'd like to offer a few thoughts on delight, uh, improvisation, and mindful awareness. So created, creativity, first delight. Creativity, or pleasure as, uh, as Kate referred to. Creativity to me is discovery and delight. And my goal is to discover, to learn something uh, new about life, to find interesting sounds, stories, patterns of speech, uh, to develop them into something interesting, and to be in exchange, in a flow with the world. Uh, the place, the time, the subject, the materials that I gather, and it's to notice, to listen, and to see. And then, with all that, to become aware of possibilities with it. And, and to be surprised, to find delight in the everyday. As the psychologist uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi uh, asked, how can interest and curiosity be cultivated? And he said, try to be surprised by something every day. <laughs> and I try for that. Uh, Suzuki Roshi, the Zen master, uh, in speaking of beginner's mind, said that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. So I try to not know. I don't always succeed. I think I know a lot sometimes, but I try to not know. To be in delicious uncertainty and to enjoy what Leonard Bernstein calls the delights and dangers of ambiguity. Um, and again, Chick sent me Hai says that creativity makes day-to-day -day experiences more vivid, enjoyable, and rewarding. So that's one of the reasons why I create. Um, then improvisation. Second is improvisation. Creativity is the improvisation of life and the composition of the moment. Uh, my, one of my favorite composers, Igor Stravinsky, said, I stumble on something unexpected, and this unexpected element strikes me. I make a note of it. At the proper time, I put it to profitable use. So, it's not just noticing and listening and seeing, but it's recombining and reframing, and then playing with the elements and being played by them putting them together, hopefully, in an intriguingly new way. So, you know, when I moved to Utah, I heard about the Navajo um, song dog myth. They believe that uh, a coyote came out of a hole in the ground of the earth when there was nothing on it and sang the world into existence. And I've always loved that, uh, but I, because I think we all have that capability to sing our worlds into existence. But it's also to be sung into existence by the world. Um, so it's not just to improvise, but also to be improvised by the world and to be open to the process and to the state of being alive, of becoming what we can be. And then last, I want to mention about what I, why I think creativity and wellness, as, as others have said, are, are the same. It, that it's, it's about mindful awareness either way. So wellness to me implies wholeness, self-acceptance, self-love, um, which flows from an awareness of connectedness, as uh, Nalini referred to, or the humanizing element, as uh, Tanisha referred to, you know, connectedness to life, to all beings. And, and it grows from the practice of kindness and compassion, empathy, and a sense of goodwill and friendliness. So the goal of both creativity and wellness is to establish this connectedness, to engage directly with experience, with the world, to be present, to be here, to be alive, to the moment. And yes, creativity, as I said earlier, is noticing, listening, and seeing, but it's also responding to what we notice, responding to what is, which requires awareness of what is. So I'll just close with the words, well, some words, of T.S. Eliot, when he wrote about the awful daring 
of a moment's surrender, by this and this only we have existed. Hey, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm busy over here writing something down. So uh, thank you, Philip. Um, thank you so much to everybody. Um, I really, I, I have so many questions to ask, but I want to go to the Q&A because I see that somebody actually uh, has asked one. Um, Susan Anderson wants to know whether you can talk about the relationship between oh, creativity and talent. Um, there's a can of worms, right? That is for those of, um, of you who aren't professional artists, how do we recommend that we add that they add more creativity to their lives in a daily way. Um, did that make sense? I changed all the pronouns in a way that was totally unnecessary as I as I went. But um, what do you recommend for people who um, believe themselves to be ta talentless but who want to be creative in their daily lives? First, we all have talents. I mean, we all are creative. And for me, just briefly. Uh, Creativity is just in the way we are. It's, it's not about producing something that then gets judged or commodified. It, it, the way we look at things, the way we look at a tree as we walk down the street is a creative act. So you, are, you Susan, and, and anybody that you might be speaking for in your question are all capable of being creative in their lives. Well, and Dominica just uh, just put in the chat the question, what is talent? And I wonder, Dominica, uh, whether you might say a couple of more words about that? This is one of those moments when I ask a question that I absolutely don't know the answer to. That's just like my general response to that. But I, I just like think that, I don't know, I feel so aligned like with everything that you just shared, Philip. so thank you. And also I think I feel aligned because I think you, like we're saying a lot of the same things in very different ways, which is so exciting. And um, and I don't know, I think I think it's exactly like, uh, it's, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to answer this. Sorry. Does anybody have? Um, I have a thought, Kate. Um, Nalini. Yeah, when I, I think that, I think people are, I think it's a really good observation that many people say, oh, I can't draw, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't do this. And I found when we put people in mixed groups, when there are scientists and artists together, that when an artist attempts something scientific, like, oh, let me put a straight line trans to make measurement trees every 10 meters, that puts them in sort of a novice position. And that sometimes has allowed the scientist to say, well, I'll pick up the chalk and I'll try the mural making because I see that you've tried my science. And so sometimes the sheer act of putting people together, which of course is harder right now in the COVID time when we're not physically together, but seeing people make an attempt can often trigger other people to say, okay, I'm gonna be as courageous as you are and try something that I'm not an expert in. And I've seen this so often in an academic context where people are so sensitive about not being an expert that they won't even try. But I think mushing people together and, and saying, yeah, I'm not an artist, but I'm gonna go ahead and make it, try something. And modeling that behavior across disciplines can often encourage people to, to make that next step. When they do find out, as Philip said, that they too are creative, have talent, can, can create something. Yeah, I think it's really useful to note the distinction, and I see that Tanisha also has something to, to say about this, that to note the distinction between expertise and talent. And we often think that people who have labored at something all their lives and so therefore have become effortlessly good at some things, although never effortlessly good at everything because we all face that difficulty that Dominica was talking about every single day uh, when we go into our studios together. But um, we look effortlessly good at some things and people say, oh, that's talent, but it's not, um, probably. It's more, much more expertise. Tanisha, Nicole, what do you have to add? Yeah, I mean, I would, I think, when I think about my personal definition of creativity, uh, I think that it is, um, and as it relates to talent and things, I believe it is an execution of passion. 
So if you do not have a passion or a drive for something, uh, then you cannot be fully creative. But the minute that you allow yourself to embrace that passion or um, really just go for it and allow it to just exist as it is, not care about the, there, there is, there is passion and creativity and then there is craft and craft I think is where we're getting caught up in the nuances of like when you edit a line or cut something or do something of that nature and that happens you can you can teach craft you can teach the rules but you can't teach someone to be passionate about what it is that they want to create change with um, so I think that if you don't have passion at the center um, that then you can't really go on to do the work of the talent um, because the talent is so much more scoped um, and chiseled out from your passions, I would say. Yeah, I think I think I'm I think I had such a strong reaction to that now and looking back because um, ta like the word talent and, and maybe this is specifically uh, being in dance circles feels uh like um like painful to hear like you are talented or you are not you have a certain amount of talent and if you don't have that right amount of talent then you won't be successful in what you're passionate about and so i think i i like to move exactly away from like the thought of talent and that you just said craft feels so like so good like um how can you move into some like it, like all that talent really feels like is just like tapping into something that you want to know better. And so if you have this creative outlook, like Philip said, of like looking at the trees, like just wonder in something and then tapping into like what makes you the, like what you're most, like most wondrous about, then talent doesn't seem to be as important. And then I think it's about time and, and space and yeah, and tapping in. Just moving away from the binary, talent feels binary to me, like you are or you aren't. I really think that's, uh, that's right. I'm not seeing other questions coming now in through the Q&A. So I think I'd like to ask um, a question that for some of you has already been right on the surface and for others of you, it's been a little bit submerged in, in what you've talked about, but it does seem to me as if every single one of you has been deeply involved in a collaborative practice on some level or another. And I wonder if you can talk, uh, any or all of you really explicitly, um, Nilini has addressed this maybe most directly already, but really explicitly about what collaboration the process collaboration has brought to you uh, as a creator. For me, the collaborative process um, is really what I find to be sacred space. Meaning, when I work with others, if they're six years old or if they're 75 years old, it doesn't really matter. They're always going to bring a different kind of insight into me because I see the world as it exists for me, and I'm five foot two, and um, you know, and I have a certain lens that I look at. And then when I work with somebody that's six foot two, they're going to see the world in a different way. So. For me, it's about looking and kind of feeling how other people can see the world. And that's why I continue to do it. And it's that sacred space that we enter into when we're together trying to find a common language and goal. Great. Also, Kim, uh, I'm, a, I'm also a small person um, <laughs> in, in my size. Um, I'm thinking that the person who's six foot two, if I were making a mural with that person, would be working on a different part of the mural. <laughs> Right. Yeah, absolutely, because, <laughs> because that person wouldn't need a ladder, and it's really easy for me to get down to those spaces right down at the at the bottom. Um, yeah, I can't see the dust on the top of refrigerators, so you know I see the world really <laughs> differently, right? My well, refrigerator doesn't read either. Uh, great, Philip. Well, yeah, as another uh, since this is the small person's part of the group, I'm a I'm a small person, a little taller, uh, maybe five five. So maybe we'll keep inching up here. But anyway, uh, as a, as a uh, 
songwriter or as a compo as a composer in particular, I haven't done that much collaboration. I did collaborate with a choreographer, uh, well, a couple times, including one for um, uh, RDT uh, about 15, 20 years, no, 25 years ago. Um, and that there were, there were some things that weren't so uh, easy about that, I have to admit. And then... Um, and then uh, as a songwriter, I've collaborated with my friend Kate McLeod on a few songs. But I think as a, as a creator of music, I still kind of like an old world um, do-it-myself thing. But, but if I broaden collaboration out to like sort of a community thing, I mean, well, first of all, in my groups, my punk band and my new folk band, Red Rock Roundup, very collaborative in terms, I mean, I, yes, I write the songs, but we're very collaborative in, ter in terms of the... Um, arrangements, what parts people play. We discuss them, we try things, and, uh, and, and, and the way in which the uh, band works as a business, all very collaborative. And then last thing, I was, well, two last things. As mayor of Springdale, all about collaboration. I mean, that was, that was the only reason I enjoyed it. The only reason I enjoyed it, I did, it was, you know, it was not a top-down thing. Um, I actually replaced a mayor that was just like our current president, you know, it stirred things up, made things worse anytime there was a problem. And so I came in with a totally like committed to like collaboration, working with people. And then in my teaching at the university, uh, I, I take a collaborative approach to the way in which the dialogue and the discussion works. So I'm very much into it in a social way, but I'm not, but I'm a little bit not sure about it in terms of, you know, the art that I create. Tanisha Nicole, you're collaborate. Oh, I'm sorry, Dominica, were you about to speak? No. Um, Tanisha Nicole, your collaboration also is not so much on the surface, and I'm not going to take the time to argue with Philip about whether he's collaborative in his art or not. We can talk about that later, but um, <laughs> yours is also less on the surface, but you've been on teams, um, yeah. right? Which not all poets are. I wonder if you want to say anything about what that has brought to you as an artist? Yeah, I mean, um, being on a team uh, in the sense of poetry is very, um, it's very jarring, uh, but so is putting numbers to art and calling it like a sport. Um, but for me, um, my, so I guess the most memorable team experience I had was in 2018, I was a member of the Salt Lake City um, Unified Slam team. And myself and four other poets all came together and we wanted to do um, what is known as a concept bout. Salt Lake poets have this thing um, that's pretty well known in the community of poetry of um, taking a concept and writing into it and they can all stand alone but also have nods to each other as interconnected. And my team ended up doing um, one that was about the Wizard of Oz and so we all took on a persona from The Wizard of Oz and then collaboratively wrote poems that like went into, um, I mean, they were all metaphors, right? For what it is to be a person of color, what it is to, um, you know, have this concept of academia over like a trade school or a business or anything of that nature and just kind of how um, these characters can be stand-ins for uh, a greater conversation. And for me, um, I actually got to collaborate with the character who played, or the writer who wrote Dorothy's lines, uh, because I wrote um, Oz, but me and Dorothy are both uh, femme presenting people. And so we approached it as this idea of the ways in which like masculinity and men have often um, taken, consistently taken or asked for things um, that come from the labor of women and what that means or or the women that are behind those men and so for uh, myself and Dorothy we were able to really collaborate together and talk about like our own individual experiences um, as being perceived as women and femme but also then what it looks like to empower ourselves and to give back and to be um, to be a voice that otherwise isn't present or wasn't there um, so that's it, it's a really um, intense and interesting experience, but it's also one where it can be very difficult if you don't have somebody that wants to do the same type of work and exploration of self to really bring out the most, um, 
I guess, truthful, honest, and like ultimately raw and vulnerable piece it can come together. So it can be very frustrating, um, but I was lucky enough to have a really rewarding experience with it. Um, I think maybe we have time for one more question. And this sort of set, um, I think it, it smears together with the collaboration question in an interesting way. So feel free uh, if you're going to address it also to um, continue to address collaboration. Uh, and then after we have a nice full answer to this question, we'll go into our guided meditation um, for those of you who are up for that. Um, Elise Lazar is curious about whether any of you, and I know that some of you have, um, have brought your creativity into arenas or communities where wellness is deeply needed. Uh, and her example uh, is a prison. So I know Nalini and um, Kim have both done that. Kim has her hand up. So, uh, Kim, can you? Yeah, I would. I would love to talk about this. You know, um, I I did um, made art with um, folks that were incarcerated at both the, um, the the youth level, the young adult, female and male levels. And one of the one time, um, you know, because because in our our culture, to be able to get money, you have to be able to prove that something's working. So, I hired an educational psychologist to come in and do a pre and post evaluation of these classes that I had done weekly with this with a group of women for about six months and one of the things that this evaluation showed us is that the testing showed that their self-esteem went up their problem-solving went up and their communication skills went up just by meeting once a week and to make art together so they were able to do that but the other thing that was distressing to me is that their depression also went up and so when I asked the women you know what what what, what what's happening here why is why did your depression go up and their response to me was, you know, we've had this experience for six months and now it's over. So we no longer have this place to come into, to be together and to make art every week with someone like, you know, it, with someone that is different than their day-to-day -day lives where there isn't a lot of freedom. Right. I mean, this is a situation where you have to ask to go to the restroom kind of thing. Right. So um, I think that's what um, we need more art in, in within these institutions. Um, and, you know, I hope to do more of that within there. So. That's great. Anyone, anyone else? Uh, Philip. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you were not in the middle of my screen. <laughs> uh there yeah well first of all hi elise and hi jill a couple of the participants i recognize the names of um yeah i uh about 25 years ago worked as a mentor in the uh washington county youth crisis center which half uh one side was for uh kids who were being abused and needed a place to go but the other half was essentially a youth prison uh, and um, I worked with those kids, and I'd come every week, and I tried to provide them with examples of how you could do crazy stuff, like write a piece about a guy and his cows and actually get rewarded for it, uh, at least with some applause, if not money. And um, so I said, you know, you guys are all creative. You know, like speaking to Susan's question, they're all creative, but their creative acts were like robbing a store, or getting into a fight or something like that. And I said, you know, you could turn your creativity to something uh, – odd and, and, and yet still, you know, still be rewarded for it. And then I wrote a piece based on my, my visits to them where I took their voices and stories and the sounds of their cells, the, you know, hitting the, their metal toilets with their pillows like they said they do. Uh-oh, did I go away? Oh, there I am. Uh, like they said they did in the middle of the night, they would slam their pillows. And I said, well, do it. I want to record it. And I'd get inside their cells, have them slam the cell door on me, get that sound. And I created a piece called Lockdown, where they talk about how much they feel they failed their mothers, how much they miss their mothers, uh, what, you know, what they'd like to do when they get out. And um, it was a, a feeling, I had a feeling that it was a validation for them, even though many, probably most of them never heard the piece because they moved on before I finished it and I, I'm not allowed to know who they are or what their names you know anything so but still I feel like it was validating the idea that these kids in the youth crisis system the youth you know prisons um, you know have these feelings and thoughts and and I've gone back to uh, prison systems to play this I played it for adult prisoners and uh, so that they could hear what these kids have to say and they never fail to 
cry when they hear these kids talking about their mothers. So that you know, I, and so I agree with Elise. It's important, and I and I eventually want to go into the prisons and do some mindfulness practice. I know that's already being done, but you know, I'm going to look for a chance to do that as well. All right. Um, thank you so much. I have uh, allowed irresponsibly allowed this uh, to go um, <laughs> ten minutes over, and I'm hoping that those of you who've been hanging on for the the guided uh, mindfulness exercise will still be able to um, give 10 more minutes to us, but um, thanks, thanks so much to everybody so far. And uh, now, Philip, it's, it's yours for the next 10 minutes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I mean, I've really enjoyed this, and I'm going to send, I'm glad to know that this recording will be available, because I have friends that couldn't come that would like to see it. So I look forward to that link, and we'll share that. Um, so Kate has asked me to guide us in a five-minute uh, mindfulness meditation. But first, just in case this is new for some of you, I'll just give a brief introduction to the practice. Um, so we've all dealt with a lot of stress and worry this year with the with the pandemic uh with the election and you know with other things uh and it just continues and and even without that we all have lots of competing demands on our time and attention so i hope that this practice can bring some more ease to all of that it's a simple but powerful way to find a quiet comforting and rejuvenating place uh, within yourself in the midst of all the stresses and ups and downs of our lives. And I think that's important to emphasize that it's within yourself, it's there. Uh, to find that place and to make it available to you whenever you need it, I'll guide you in a simple practice. It's a skill that you already have, but you can cultivate. And it's called mindfulness meditation. And it's been very helpful in my own life and in the millions of lives of people who, who practice it around the world. So what is mindfulness? I mean, you see it on the cover of magazines. <laughs> um, mindfulness is simply awareness cultivated by paying attention in a sustained and a particular way. And it's the practice of being fully present and alive. It's a deliberate training of attention that maintains a moment-to-moment -moment awareness of our thoughts, our feelings, our breath, our bodily sensations, in our surrounding environment. And this deliberate training steadies the mind and strengthens concentration. So mindfulness can enrich and deepen our experience of our daily life, some of the things we've talked about today, and it can awaken and inspire our creativity. And perhaps relevant to some of you, I don't know if we have students here or, or professors, I know we have some, mindfulness has been found to be invaluable in academic settings. Because universities can be stressful places. Mindfulness can help with this problem. In a study published in the Journal of Behavioral Medicine, students exposed to eight to ten weeks of meditation practice significantly decreased their levels of anxiety and depression, even during especially stressful finals periods. And an experiment at the University of California showed that meditation training improved the efficiency of our mind, freeing up extra space for increased attention and introspection. So that's why it's studied and taught at great universities all over the country, such as Harvard, Stanford, Vanderbilt, and right here at the University of Utah. So in a few seconds, I'm going to introduce you to this practice, and some of you already do it, um, in a five-minute session. But before I do, I told you about what, medit what mindfulness is, but now I want you to know one important thing that mindfulness is not. It's not stopping our minds from thinking. Thinking is natural and happens on its own. So when thoughts come to you, as they will, <laughs> during our meditation, please be assured that you are not doing anything wrong. But you, the point of mindfulness is not to get rid of thought. It's simply to be aware that it is happening. So when you become aware that you are thinking, you are doing it right. So let's do an easy five-minute meditation. So find a posture that allows your body to be relaxed and at ease, as much as possible, where you can feel grounded and stable, comfortable and alert. 
and take a couple of deep breaths to let go and become more fully present. And if you haven't done so already, letting your eyes close gently, or if you prefer, keeping them partially open. Let the eyes and face be soft, loosen the jaw, relax your shoulders and let your arms and hands rest easily. Letting your awareness fill your whole body. Simply noticing sensations in the body, what it's like sitting here in this moment. Letting go of the patterns of being busy and spread thin. Letting go of your to-do list for the time being. You don't need to do anything. You can simply rest in your awareness, sensing the whole body sitting here. Now, bringing your awareness to your left foot and noticing any feeling there, whether warmth or coolness or pressure, vibration, lightness, heaviness, just whatever is there. And now the right foot, feeling it from the inside out, just tuning into it. And now feeling both feet and noticing any possible differences between the two. Just noticing. Now in the same way, letting your awareness briefly and lightly scan your body, noting any particular sensations that are predominant. Just letting them be there. Noticing whether they change as you give them your attention. Just a simple presence, being in the body. And now noticing that within the body, there is a breath, there is breathing. Noticing where you feel it the most, or where it's the most pleasant. Whether that's the nostrils, Feeling the air coming in, perhaps cooler, and going out a little warmer, or the rise and fall of the chest, or the belly. And sensing the very beginning of an in-breath, to the end of that, and the pausing, and then the out-breath, and then again. giving your attention to the whole breath and feeling it, whether at your nostrils, chest, or belly, or feeling its movement in the whole body. What does it feel like as the body breathes? Now opening to sounds, to hearing. They might be sounds in your room or outside the room. Quiet sounds, loud sounds, the sound of my voice, or the sound of silence. Letting the sounds come to you. No need to reach out. No need for effort. And finally, allowing your awareness to include the anticipation of the sound 
and then the sound itself of our closing bell. So you can open your eyes now. Just a couple more things. I really hope that was a pleasant experience for you. But it isn't always. Things can come up like sleepiness, pain, worry, self-judgment. So whether you found it relaxing or enlivening or boring or uncomfortable or of thoughts like, am I doing it right, kept coming up, Please know that all these experiences are completely natural and normal. The key is to simply be aware that you are having them, that they are present. And this was just a taste, a window into the practice, a small little window, which you can develop and sustain over time. Practice sessions can be 10 or 20 minutes or an hour or more, but they can also be five minutes like this one or even less. What really strengthens the practice is consistency. So if you can do a little bit every day, your practice will deepen. So I hope that you will explore it on your own. And if you want more guidance, you can go to the webpage of the University of Utah's Mindfulness Center, which offers online meditations and self-help resources, and there are others online. Plus my wife, Charlotte Bell, and I offer courses periodically. And if any of the Participants here are students, um, and I'm fortunate enough to have you in one of my honors courses one day, such as Radical Quiet this spring or Composing a Community next fall. I include a five to ten minute meditation in every class session. Plus, students are given guidance and instructions for practice at home. So again, I'm honored to have been with all of you today and, to, and that you've shared this practice with me. So may you be safe, happy, healthy, and well. Thank you for that, um, Philip. It's going to send me uh, more uh, restfully, mindfully into my day. And then thank you again to each of you who took the time to join us and let me keep you late to Nisha Nicole, Dominica, Nalini, and Kim. I am so grateful to your presence and I'm grateful to the Tanner Humanities Center for giving us the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Erica, Katie and Beth. Thank you, Kate. I too wanted to thank the Tanner Humanities team, Susan, Beth, and Katie. Um, and thank you especially for putting together such a powerful panel. We will make it available. Um, I also would like to thank, in addition to my team, our sponsor, the OC Tanner Foundation. So please continue to connect with us. Please look for us at um, our website, which is www.thc.utah.edu. And thank you to our attendees. Um, we truly appreciate your taking the time to be present with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you all. Thank you so much.